According to the website, isitdreamforceyet.com, there's 257 days to go before we do the, the annual major global mind blowing. And I've got 45 minutes to get you ready for that. What I want to do with you tonight is to talk about something that is not an industrial revolution because many of our customers hear the word industrial and think that's, that's not what we do. We're not smokestack. We don't dig stuff up and manufacture it and move it. We're not an industrial company. So I want to talk about the outcome of all those revolutions, which is the opportunity and necessity for bringing a level of engagement that's simply never been seen before, never been possible before, but is now absolutely demanded. We are, of course, a publicly traded company. Uh, if I say anything tonight that describes something we don't yet sell, do not invest in us or do business with us based on that. I have neither the intention nor the authority to pre-announce anything, but you all knew that. You're a successful company or you are a member, of a, a member of a successful company, and if I'm going to come up here and tell you that you need to do things differently, you might be inclined to say, show us what we're doing wrong. At some point, doing the right thing brilliantly well doesn't merely become the old thing, it becomes the wrong thing. And the question is, when does that happen? There's a famous quote from the, the economist John Maynard Keynes, when the facts change, I change my mind. I'm mildly compulsive about sourcing quotations, so I looked this one up. He probably never actually said this. <laughs> so far as we can tell, Paul Samuelson, another well-known economist, you may have used one of his books at one time or another, uh, said this, attributed it to Keynes, and they've been quoting Keynes on it ever since. But it's still a really important idea that I want to share with you tonight. And the first exponentially changing fact is the sheer amount of capacity to connect in this world. I had to look this up the other day because I could barely believe it. The first iPhone was in fact a 2G device, which was so long ago that we weren't even calling it 2G, any more than they called World War I World War I before there was a World War II. <laughs> All the bandwidth on the entire planet when that non-camera equipped, non-app store supported, lame little expensive tool came to market would have given the average human being on the planet roughly three ringtones a day. Not three phone calls, three ringtones. Fast forward to the year 2020, you're looking at a thousand-fold expansion of networks, wireless capacity, phone circuits, the works. And that much difference, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you 3,000 ringtones. With three hours of connectivity per person, I can give you five different versions of Beethoven's Ninth, along with extensive commentary on why Dudamel is different from Von Karajan. Okay? And more importantly, we can collect data from you, whether you're giving it to us or not, frankly, <laughs> because, because as Peter Sondergaard at Gartner said, the future of market research is not asking people, what do you want? As Steve Jobs famously said, they won't know what they want until I show it to them. What we can do is measure what people seem to be trying to do and show them the answer to a question that they might not know how to ask, or might not ever even thought of asking. Because the thing you want to bring them solves a problem that's been part of their lives for so long that they've started to think of it as like friction or rust or gravity, just something you have to tolerate. And so often, the opportunity to get eyeball to eyeball with someone and say, this thing that you think you have to accept as a necessary obstacle or problem or cost is now fixable. Did you realize that? And I've had three or four conversations like that just today. And sometimes it's a matter of, oh yeah, that was, that was addressed. The MIT preprint came out this morning over breakfast. I mean, that's how fast the time scale of change has become. But customers, despite all this bandwidth, don't feel more connected. They don't. They say they feel less connected to companies than they did a few years ago. By the way, you'll notice the green arc and the yellow arc. The green arc is consumers, the yellow arc is business buyers. Oh, there's another thing we all think we know, that the B2B buyer is somehow very different from the B2C buyer. Not so much. Experience that people have as consumers is now beginning to inform their expectations as B2B buyers. And bringing them that special experience is now becoming just as much of a thing. They want you to know what you've done with them in the past 
so that you address the concerns that they have and move forward with them and anticipate their evolving needs. They want you to have service and sales no longer be sequential. Service is no longer the damage control department for the over-promising and under-delivery of your salespeople. I'm sorry. Service is now actually your major source of profitability. Everyone wrings their hands every time Apple says people are keeping their iPhones longer. Missing the point that if Apple stopped selling all hardware tomorrow, that little side business of App Store and iTunes and iCloud would only be a revenue stream the size of Coca-Cola with their cut off the top of business the size of Starbucks. The growth of the opportunity to have what used to be the end of the relationship when you sell them the product now become the beginning of the delivery of the value stream of the services is frankly quite underappreciated in most businesses today. And the expression think outside the box you know, you do need to think outside your own box, but you also need to think outside of everybody else's boxes. You need to ask the question, how do we get beyond people buying a thing, buying a thing, and buying a thing, and some assembly is required? How do we sell them the interoperable, orchestrated solution, some of which will be delivered by partners, but still under the aegis of our brand? Because that is how you become the hub of an ecosystem and not merely one of many vendors of, of piecemeal components. This is an, uh, the, uh, the expression system of systems. How do you become the go-to that solves the problem and doesn't just merely provide one piece of the product that they need to, to, uh, to construct? The expression, you know, being inside the box invites a little thought experiment. Don't think of the edge of your box as a boundary. Look at those edges and say, what is happening immediately before or during or after someone uses the thing we used to call our product? And what's the process of which it can be a part? For example, I hope you don't recognize this. It's a taser. I hope you've never been on the wrong end of one of these. This is a well-known brand. Everybody knows it. Everybody's heard of the incident where the guy was on the uh, floor. He's saying, don't tase me, bro. <laughs> now a registered trademark. It's on t-shirts. But recognizing the, shall we say, baggage that their brand was now carrying, the company rebranded itself as Axon. You may not know that brand. Taser is one of its sub-brands. But what does Axon sell? I withdraw my taser from the holster. That action begins to run a streaming video on the Axon camera strapped to my chest. I use the device to do whatever I need to get done. Reholster the device, and 30 seconds later, assuming the incident now to be concluded, the camera connects to the cloud, automatically uploads the video with metadata annotation of what was done, where, how many times I discharged my device, over what period of time. And so before I get back to the precinct house, the report's already done. Before the defendant's public defender comes charging into the district attorney complaining about excessive force, the report's already there. And you can just hand it to them and say, here's the video. Your client was subdued without injury. You sure you want to bring this complaint? And what's the result of this? The result of this is an estimated tripling of the time that an officer can actually spend on the street getting stuff done because they're not filling in a report that will be debated as to whether it was accurate. They're not sitting in court testifying in a case that was dropped because the data was incontrovertible. The product is not the device. The product is public safety and criminal justice productivity. And notice also, if I sell you 100 tasers, we're done until you start to need another batch. But now, Axon is part of the everyday routine process of criminal justice and public safety in these cities. Much stickier relationship, much more integrated into what that customer is actually getting done all the time. And this is why you want to treat your product now as the beginning of an opportunity to deliver a stream of value. Part of the opportunity to become integrated into how the consumer, the product, the, 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 the customer organization gets their stuff done, to the point that doing without you becomes inconceivable. Because the products we sell today are really very, very good. 
In 1975, a BMW 318i was considered a pretty hot vehicle, but you know what? Put it up against a modern Corolla? <laughs> I don't know if you've driven a Corolla lately, but it's got laser-driven adaptive cruise control. It will out-accelerate that BMW. It handles extraordinarily well. I was very impressed when I had one recently as a loaner car. You know, if I tape over the logos, I don't think you'd be able to tell that you weren't driving a baby Benz. <laughs> Wristwatches, 1975, a Rolex Samarin was 350 bucks. Today for 20 bucks more, I can sell you something that's solar powered, far more accurate, just as robust. And an iPhone, uh, sorry, $1,000 for an iPhone X sounds like a lot of money to you compared to that brick <laughs> that Gordon Gecko used to carry, where you had to tell your friends, I'll have the phone turned on from two to three in the afternoon because that was the only battery life you were going to get. It's easy to forget how good the worst product you can buy today really is, and to realize that trying to differentiate on product now is really quite difficult to do, because a $10 Casio actually keeps just as good time as that $10,000 Rolex. And so differentiating at the level of experience, which used to be an attribute of a luxury brand, is now increasingly becoming something that every brand needs to ask, how do I differentiate at the level of engagement and special defining experience? Because co customers will tell you, companies aren't stepping up. They are not giving me the experience. And I would give them more money if they would give me a better experience. Data from our own connected customer study, data from American Express, from any number of sources, confirms that people say, I leave companies that give me bad experience. I pay more willingly for people who consistently impress me. The customer who's had no service experiences with you may not dislike you. The customer who's had a pleasantly surprising service experience with you becomes your most powerful brand evangelist. And this is true for business buyers as well as for consumers. We have companies who make industrial products who've actually done the thought experiment of going to their own website and saying, if I buy this machine, how long does it take me to assemble the whole package around it that allows me to install it and operate it and test it and certify it and so on? Because if I buy a pair of shoes on Amazon, in the moment they will offer me the spare shoelaces and probably the matching purse. If I go and buy a building chiller, how long does it take me to find all the piping, wiring, and skills to install it and everything else? One of our customers did that exercise. It took them an hour, and they wound up going to nine different websites that all belonged to them. <laughs> but it was like doing business with nine separate companies. And they said, we have to bring that notion of, once we know what you're trying to do, we'll give you the whole package, the whole solution. We'll tell you what you need. We won't let you be in the position of having to say, oh, shoot, forgot Forgot that. Now it's going to be another week before we can go live. And so the experience really does overshadow the product. I noticed recently that Facebook used to trade at 40 times earnings and Google only 20. And now they've converged. Why? Facebook and Google are turning into the same thing. They just started from different places. Amazon and Walmart. Did any of you watch the Pyongyang Olympics? Where they were saturation bombing the Walmart ads, you know, corner to corner. Did any of you notice a single ad in which someone was shown physically shopping in a Walmart store? I didn't. I was watching carefully. Every single one of those ads was people in their homes with Walmart responding to, oh, you've ordered diapers every two weeks, you need another you know, package of diapers delivered, all about the delivery to the door. It was like an Amazon ad with blue logos. And Amazon has brick and mortar stores. And they are converging on the same thing, which is we don't care how you want to get it. We'll make sure it shows up when you need it, the way you want it. They're both moving toward that same destination. Now, you can do this badly. US retail banks, it's estimated, spent $20 billion in 2017 to digitally transform apps, websites, 24-7 phone banking. Congratulations, guys. Your customer satisfaction went down. Brand loyalty went down. And the biggest satisfaction gap between digital-only and non-digital-only customers was not my demographic, millennials. 
They want to look you in the eye, they want to look you in the eye. They want a relationship based on authenticity and personality. They do. You can't just wait for my generation to die and then throw away all the, the, the storefronts. Sorry. <laughs> and in fact, bank tellers' salaries are going up. There are more people today with the job title of bank teller than there were when the ATM was invented. And they're worth more. Why? Because now they're not counting out the $20 bills. Oh, I'm sorry, the $100 bills. As of last week, for the first time ever, there are more $100 than $1 bills in circulation. 80% of them are outside the US. I wonder what they're being used to do. <laughs> but the tellers are having conversations with you about your college savings plan and your retirement account and your integrated portfolio of services. They're business value creators now, not just organic manipulator arms for, for something that an ATM does better. And better is not a generic thing. The generation that's inheriting $30 trillion wants a personalized experience, but notice that what they view as a better experience differs significantly from one demographic to another. Some people want a better face-to-face -face meeting experience. Some people want a 24-7 online experience. It's important not to think that AI is one color lipstick that goes on every pig. It is not. You need to be saying, what's the kind of experience that needs to be enhanced? That is not a technology exercise. That is a, oh, I'm sorry, actually understanding your customer exercise. And when I want to make a room full of dedicated IT people squirm uncomfortably in their seats, I say, you know this job you took? Because you really are more comfortable with machines than with human beings. I've got some news for you. Your ability to get inside the heads of people, figure out what motivates them or what scares them, is actually going to be more important to your ability to create value for the rest of your career. And the whole notion of the way that Slalom likes to engage with its customers is very much, as I mentioned earlier in, in the Q&A uh, when we were asked, what do we take away from the day? So many of the breakouts today had a subtext of, guess what? This is no longer a technology adoption challenge. This is a behavior change and culture change challenge. It's much more fun. It's much more interesting. It's also a new skill set. And so when Capital One looks at this, they say, you know, if you're talking to someone through a teller cage, you're expecting a certain level of transaction. You may be almost literally blind to the possibility that they're ready to start functioning, in effect, as a personal financial advisor, because that's not a conversation you've had with a bank teller before. So what have they done? They've created these Capital One cafes, a different environment in which a different experience becomes comprehensible, natural, a place where you drop in, hang out, and every now and then there's something up on the big screen back there that talks about a new financial services offering. It's a much more natural way of engaging with someone who you want to become an advisory part of your life and not just a transactional uh, medium for the times when you need some cash. Now, fortunately, with this tsunami of data that's coming at us, the computational power is there to do something with it. I will point out that that is a logarithmic scale. Every time it goes up the same amount, it's another factor of 10. Without this, all of that data would simply be better archival of the activities that are the byproducts of what we did yesterday. That would not be very exciting. That would not have much opportunity to create new value. But when you have that kind of computational power that you can throw at the data, and if you do it correctly, interesting results can arise. We had a breakout session on AI today, and it occurs to me that one of the most important questions that's not asked in those uh, conversations with customers is, why is it different this time? The terms AI winter, first and second AI winter, those are well-defined terms in the literature. They relate to the first exciting period in the 60s when we discovered that we simply didn't have the hardware to do this properly. An AI workstation from Tektronix in 1985 had eight megabytes of memory. I have had to explain to my millennial sons what a megabyte is. It's roughly one thousandth of a G byte. And they say, really? You could do something in that? And then there was the second AI winter, 
when systems were built that turned out to make dandy laboratory scale prototypes but did not survive in the long run because of the sheer number and complexity of the rules required to represent anything non-trivial. But then we connected the planet and we enriched it with several orders of magnitude greater capability to squeeze understanding out of the data. And so something very interesting happened. It was at one point thought that if you had a program that could play chess at a grandmaster or even just a master level, that would be an existence proof of general machine intelligence. As it turns out, it's nothing of the kind. It's an existence proof of something that can play chess. But the way in which those chess programs were developed was by having people explain the rules of the game until a game playing behavior emerged. Explain, sorry, the moves. You know, watch, let him look at suggestions from chess masters. Google took the game of Go, a computationally far more challenging game with a history of several hundred years of very interesting strategies. And in tournament play against one of the world's top five Go players, it made a move so unprecedented, so unlike anything that had ever been done in the multi-century recorded history of the game, that he had to get up and leave the room and think about it for 10 minutes before he had any idea of what to do. And everyone subsequently agreed it was an absolutely brilliant move and completely original. Why was that even possible? Because it had not been instructed by human players. It had learned by playing against copies of itself. So for those of you who remember the final pivotal scene in the movie War Games, when the machine plays tic-tac-toe against itself until it comes up with the insight that the only winning move is not to play, major moral lesson of story of the movie, well, that's a reality. If you're waiting for the Skynet moment when the systems can devise an original insight and do something completely unexpected, it's happened, but they don't have the launch codes yet. I'll let you think about who does, never mind. <laughs> it's not about technology. It is about behavior. The problem I have with the labels of, of the Industrial Revolutions is that they're so often labeled with what people think is a defining technology that misses the point. The first revolution was not the steam revolution, it was the production revolution. It was the possibility that now you could have 20 horsepower driving Robert Fulton's boat without putting 20 horses on the deck running a treadmill. Now that 20 horsepower engine for its time was considered remarkably small. The fact that you could put it on a boat and still have the boat float was a major accomplishment. And getting permission to import that technology to the US from Britain was roughly as difficult as getting a nuclear weapon exported you know, from, from this country would be today. It was very sensitive strategic technology. But what was the flip side of the fact that most steam engines were hulking monsters? You had to build the factory around them, and people had to come to the factory. And so Manchester, England doubled its population twice in the first half of the 19th century, because people had to come to the power. The technology was interesting. The social transformation of a rural agrarian economy into a city-dwelling factory worker population was ultimately far more important. But people don't talk about that. They say, oh, it was about steam. No, it really wasn't. It was about factories and workforces. And the second revolution, electricity, was important not because of electricity being different, but because the first one was a production revolution. The second one was a distribution revolution. Because unlike steam power, an electrical power grid can take the energy anywhere. Electric motors can be very small. Batteries can be self-contained. All sorts of models, like a mobile workforce in an entrepreneurial small business workshop, suddenly become possible. Again, a social, economic transformation made possible by, but not guaranteed by, the replacement of one technology with another. The third revolution, not merely power, but information. I was at Baton Rouge Chemical Plant the first time that we installed its first digital control room. And at the end of the shift, instead of literally going to a cabinet, opening it, taking the paper chart off the wall, looking at the ink lines on it, saying, yep, didn't blow up last night, sticking the paper chart in a file cabinet, never to be seen again, now we had data that we could use for computation, for trend analysis, for prediction and optimization of the processes. Because what's the fourth revolution? Production, distribution, information, optimization. 
Now we can infuse the systems with intelligence that doesn't merely make it possible for you to do what you want, which may be the wrong thing, now done faster and more consistently than ever before. But the ability for the machine to say, maybe you should consider this. Maybe here's a go move that never even occurred to you, um, poor miserable human. After all, you haven't played a million games in the last half hour. And so if I took that 19th century factory and unplugged the steam engine and plugged in an electric motor, I would be hailed as a hero. I've made it quieter, cleaner. Oh, but wait a minute. I've still got those overhead shafts and pulleys and belts. I still have people losing hands when they get caught in the machinery. I still have everybody having to show up, start work when the whistle blows, stop work and go home when I shut down the machine. Everything that's wrong with the Industrial Revolution was wrong if I just plug in an electric motor. A serious, serious defect. And you don't get to that, which is an autonomous, mobile, capable device by plugging electricity into the thing on the left. You have to literally see a different picture of how things can be, given the availability of that capability. You can't just take the thing you've added and plug it into the old context and expect a transformative result. You have to step back. Now, I'm talking about this in a very mechanistic context of you know, power and energy and stuff. Does it apply to IT? Eric Brynjolfsson, you know Eric. He's the co-author with Andy McAfee of Second Machine Age and Race Against the Machine. And you've heard his name. He's also the guy who schooled Michael Dell on the 70% tax rate at WEF last week. That was a fun conversation to watch. But he and Lauren Hitt actually went out and found examples of companies that had radically adopted digital technology without genuine organizational and cultural change. Others that had made changes, but with a very timid or tentative adoption of the technology to support them, neither of which were very exciting outcomes. And then the examples of the companies that had vigorously adopted better tools and also remade culture and process to make the best use of that new capability, who enjoyed far superior returns as a result. So technology deployment doesn't get it done. Ambitious reorganization without good support from new technology, mildly better results, but still far inferior to those who vigorously adopt a technology guided by a transformative strategy. Which brings us to the subject of acceleration. Pat Gelsinger at VMware at their recent annual conference said, do try hard to grasp the possibility, the certainty, in fact, that the pace of change today that seems so impressive is the slowest that things will be changing for the rest of your life. Long, intentional pause. Because I really do want you to have a chance to consider what that implies. It's still speeding and exponential is a term often used by people who do not know what it actually means to say, wow, it's really fast. No, I'm sorry, that is not what exponential means. We would kind of like to believe that after, oh my gosh, it's been an exponential change, good, now we can relax. No, that's not how it works. That's, that's a project mentality. That's a company saying, okay, we're gonna do a digital transformation project. No, it's not a project, and you don't get to enjoy a period of leveling off when you're done. If I take that same graph and replot it on different axes and show you a linear growth that continues at that pace, that looks really, really impressive. Until I replot those two curves and show you what actual exponential really does. It keeps going up more and more quickly indefinitely. Now, the funny thing is, individual S-curves tend to combine into something that looks like that exponential curve. This is the thing. You get a fundamental technology change, but the aggregate result is that the thing in your pocket has, if I remember the number correctly, 63 of the 84 non-radioactive elements in the periodic table are in that little box. And all you want to know is if you can get it in rose gold. This is an extraordinary piece of alchemy 
that we carry around, and we've managed to forget what a miracle of material science manufacturing technology that thing really is. It just looks like a piece of magic black glass. Don't tell me about millennials being digital natives. They didn't even have an ability to see the file system on that thing until a year and a half ago. They have no idea what's behind that glass. Trust me, I have three of them. <laughs> and when things are accelerating, it's miserably difficult, and we do it very badly to try to do competent forecasting. The World Economic Forum back in 2015 asked over 800 reasonably expert people to come up with dates and times when they thought that important changes would result. This is consistent with the observation that's been made before that many people can tell you what the future will look like. They are called futurists. Those who can correctly tell you when are called billionaires. Because getting it right is hard. They said, no, oh, the tipping point for AI being important in white collar jobs, that'll be around 2025. Oh, really? Tell that to J.P. Morgan Chase, which is doing contract validation and replacing 360,000 hours of accountant paralegal work with an algorithm called contract intelligence. And in fact, if you're not using AI now in your finance, customer service, or marketing areas, you are in the bottom four-fifths, which is not a place I think anyone really wants to be. It's not a fun place to hang out down there in the bottom four-fifths. And the problem, of course, with the label of AI is how aspirational it is. Someone actually said in 1983, do you realize that once it actually starts doing something useful consistently at a reasonable cost, we stop calling it AI? We call it face recognition. We call it speech recognition. If I told you I've got a fabulous machine vision project, I'm going to be able to take things that are almost identical and have it accurately identify one versus the other, no matter what distance or what orientation or what lighting the object is in. Doesn't that sound like something that would require artificial intelligence? Yes, it's called a barcode scanner. It would be a, a machine vision research product 40 years ago, and now it's an unconsidered, you know, just a modern utility. And so the label AI stands for, remember, this was said in 1983, that which is almost implemented. And that's why the fact that Salesforce Einstein is real AI right now really does matter to people. This brings us to another subject as exciting as AI, which is innovation. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants to believe that they're good at it. And customers are very aware of it. They are no longer impressed by what you've got. They want to know where your puck is going. They expect more frequent new services. It takes more to impress them. They actively seek to buy from innovative companies. I want you to try to remember that in 2007, when the iPhone was introduced with no app store, it came with what it had. That's the way things worked. Back then, if a software vendor sent you an unscheduled update, it was called a patch. It was a confession that they had screwed up. It was an intrusion on your day, because now you were going to have to sandbox and test and deploy something that might break things you had, and you were really not happy with them. Imagine if they did it several times a year. Imagine if they did it a couple of times a month. Well, we do that now, and it's called an app update. You look at your phone, there's a little red circle with a white number on it. You say, oh, cool, some updates. <laughs> Tap the update all button and go back to drinking your coffee or tea. And it's pivoted in less than, in, in just a little over a decade, from an annoying and risky intrusion upon your routine and a confession that a vendor had made a mistake and couldn't be trusted to deliver a quality product, into something that we actually demand as a free act of continuous improvement in the product. Roughly a decade. That's an extraordinary change. And in fact, the things that you might think they aren't really aware of, oh, they're very aware of it. They want intelligence. They want virtual and augmented reality. They are intrigued by the possibility of, of cryptocurrency capability. They, the fastest growing category of uh, technology in the home last year's uh, winter retail season was the voice activated personal assistants. And who was it today? Um, said, my kids have no idea what a radio is. When they want to hear a song, they just ask Alexa to, you know, to, to play it for them. I think, I, I think that was this afternoon that someone said that. Yeah, 
Entire categories of what used to be discrete device have now been completely subsumed into Alexa skills. That's what they called not apps, skills. Interesting word. Because I have a rude reality for the human race, we are not natural innovators, I'm sorry. The wheel, fire, yeah, OK, kind of. We got the wheel idea by watching logs roll. Beavers can do that, OK? Fire, kind of similarly. And in fact, if we wander out to the caves outside Beijing, we can see 10,000 generations of hominid evolution, 200,000 years in which their hand axes innovated from 5.5 to 4.5 centimeters. Presumably, their fingers got a little more flexible over that length of time. They did not come up with the screwdriver, let alone the laser. And if, in fact, I hand you a screwdriver, and you've got a collection of 25 different hammers and know exactly when to use each one, I guarantee you, you will take that screwdriver and attempt to pound a nail with the handle and say, well, it sort of works, but I don't see what the big deal is. And you say, no, you use that other end, and you twist. And you'll look at that, and you'll look at a nail and say, twist it how? And then you'll hand them a screw. And they'll put the screw on the wood and twist, and nothing will happen. You say, no, you have to drill the pilot hole. And this is why innovation is hard. You can't just change one thing and have people immediately understand how to use it, why to use it, or have the remaining support systems available to use it well. This is why innovation is so difficult. And we want to do the thing that defines us better. You know, we're not ignorant cavemen. Well, no, but Sony spent at least several years trying to make a brighter, flatter, lighter weight picture tube. Because the Trinitron was one of their defining innovations. It made them the absolute leader in premium TV for quite some time. And they couldn't let go. Couldn't let go of it and wound up having to go retroactively hat in hand to Samsung to get into a joint venture in flat panel technology to stay in the game. This is what happens when you fall in love with the innovation that got you here, and you can't let go of it and disrupt yourself and do the next thing. And that's hard to do organizationally. The people running the company are the people whose idea that thing was. And telling them that it's time to move on is not going to be politically easy to do. So how do you make innovation not lucky? How do you make it sustainable? Peter Drucker famously said that there are a significant number, but not a huge number, of recurring innovation opportunities. There's just a lot of words, so I'm going to boil it down to the ones that I like. <laughs> incongruities, changes in perception, new knowledge. What's an incongruity? Why do people have great stuff at home and crappy stuff at work? We founded a company based on that one. Why was it necessary to have crappy stuff at work? Well, because doing software updates is so difficult. What if we move to a completely multi-tenant and metadata-based model? You can do that? Yeah, we figured that out last week. Want to see? New knowledge. Why would I want to keep my data in some cloud that you know, is something I've never seen before? Oh, your security is actually better than mine? Oh, you can do updates over the weekend while I'm at home? Changes in perception. Three ideas that are the soul of why we are able to do what we do at Salesforce and do three upgrades a year without having people want to kill us. Can you imagine if I were actually able to deliver three upgrades a year to something like, oh, I don't know, Windows or Oracle or SAP? I, I would not survive. First of all, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't work, but then it, if it did, well, never mind. <laughs> and so when you look at how the company began, how the, each individual product came along, they came along based on some moment of incongruity that suddenly made us say, wait a minute, this is stupid. Why are we still doing it this way? We don't have to do it this way. The technology exists to do it in a fundamentally better way, but now we have to help people understand why this is what they always wanted. And if you can get that cadence going, then you too can you know, develop a consistent record of innovation. It won't happen without some effort. Paul Romer recently shared the Economics Nobel Prize. He said the strategy really has to be based on finding recipes. What is Uber? It's a software recipe wrapped around the model of people getting in cars and being driven places. It's not better cars, better drivers, or secret route maps across the city. It's a software recipe wrapped around a platform that consisted of streets, cars, and drivers that Uber doesn't have to own. 
That's a very powerful idea. But notice that Paul's example of innovation is that iron oxide had moved from being a paint to being something that goes on videotapes. Sorry, Paul, that example's going to need some refresh. <laughs> and when you look at the history of Salesforce as a, as a recognized innovator, the first of several times that we were named world's most innovative company by Forbes, they did the research and said, was there a moment you can identify? Was there a management decision that was made that turned you into this innovation engine? And it turned out that the intentional adoption of agile uh, processes and lean methods in 2006, which did not go smoothly, there was a lot of opposition to the idea because everyone knew you can't do enterprise software like that. Enterprise software requires years of requirements, definition, and a rigorous waterfall process to deliver until it doesn't. And you demonstrate that it doesn't, and you wind up being up there. And building teams that can do this, but getting teams that are diverse and diversely connected. This is a graph of the patent holder relationships in one company and the patent holder relationships in another company. Steve Jobs holds 347 patents, many awarded after he was dead. Well, there's a statement about the cultural process of innovation in one of those companies, as opposed to a much more open source and collaborative model in another company. I'm not going to say one is better or worse than another, but they are certainly different. And if you're selling to a company, it helps to understand what their culture is. And if you're in that company and trying to make things happen, it helps to have some quantitative sense of, what's the environment here? What are the networks that I really need to understand and make them be, want to work for me and not oppose me? And this is a science, and it can be approached in a scientific way. Because ultimately, it's about people's willingness to work with you. Oh, you heard uh, the Amazon make a reference to the two pizza team this morning. The team's small enough to feel a sense of personal accountability to each other. It's a critical idea. The observation from military combat, sports, performing arts, any number of disciplines. People do not do their most extraordinary things out of fear or greed, but out of a desire not to disappoint people who are important to them as colleagues, as, as family members, as members of a platoon, as members of a sports team, as members of a band, whatever. Loyalty to the group is the essence of morale. That means the group needs to be small enough that you can feel that sense of personal connection and build architectures, in which the ownership of an outcome can be meaningfully assigned to a group small enough to feel personally responsible for delivering that result. And this is the kind of decision that can be made that allows an organization to still feel like a startup, even when it's a 36,000 employee, you know, Fortune 500 member, hypothetically. And being better, faster, and cheaper is a very, very tempting siren song. Moore's Law promises us, oh, it's going to get better. Just watch. It's going to get better all by itself. You'll see. Better is not better. I can show tens of thousands of pictures of cats to a Google neural net, and it gets pretty good at recognizing a cat. Then I play it backwards and say, so what do you think a cat looks like? <laughs> Figured it out yet? A lot of the training images have ironic sayings above and below the cat's face. It literally doesn't understand that those have nothing to do with the cat. It's part of its concept of cat. <laughs> and so it does the best it can to give you texty squiggles above and below because it thinks that's part of what a cat is. <laughs> we want to believe these things are smart the same way we want to see faces in the clouds. Our brains are wired to seek out things that can interact with us. And it is natural for people to see an intelligence in these systems and impute a level of understanding in these systems that they do not have. It is a dangerous, dangerous illusion that our brains are well wired to make us suffer. And the result of this is that Gartner estimates that by 2020, companies will have a new job, which is essentially personal trainer and psychoanalyst to the neural nets. Where they're doing weird stuff, you'll say, oh, OK, I know where it's going here. I'm going to curate some specially tailored data to bring it back on track and get it, and get it behaving itself. For example, there was the women's apparel company whose AI kept telling them they should start um, selling to men. Well, fortunately, the analytic tools were there. 
As it turns out, in most of their database, the salutation field of the customer was Mr. and Mrs. And I guarantee you, the vast majority of the misters didn't really want to wear those products. But by taking the salutation field out of the predictive feed, they were able to get it back to behaving itself. Because they did go to the trouble of figuring out, why is it saying this? This is one of the key differences between the AI of now and the AI of, say, 1980-something, is that we're making much better tools for understanding, why did you just suggest that? Why did you just do that? Oh, OK. You were operating off of this piece of misunderstanding. I can fix that. And keeping people in the loop is really key, because apart from standing for almost implemented, AI also stands for one other thing. And Douglas Engelbart said, if only we had made the label stand for augmentation of intellect. Build systems that are designed to assist people and not held up as prospectively replacing them. This is ultimately a data problem. The best time to plant a tree for shade is 20 years ago, but the best you can do is to plant it right now. The best time to plan your data initiative is at least three years ago, but the best you can do is start it right now. Don't wait till the AI is done and say, great, now we can feed it some data. Oh, dear. Look at this. No, start working now, because if you've ever swept a clean room, you know what happens when you get to the corner and realize the filth you've been walking around in. You know how that feels. Well, that's what happens when you actually start to take all this data spread around your company and try to bring it all to the mouth of the AI and realize what you're about to feed it. Inconsistent, incomplete, erroneous. And so it's really important to understand every AI initiative at this point is ultimately going to depend on the quality and the coherence of the data you can feed. And getting that done takes more people on a longer time than merely throwing an inference engine into your sales tool. Especially because we have so many things that we've learned to lie about. Salespeople don't want to mark an opportunity closed and lost. They hate doing that. But if they never do it, how is your AI supposed to learn the early signs of a deal that we'll lose? We have to change behavior in some pretty fundamental ways. We have to get people to rejoice in the opportunity, to teach the AI this is the sign of a deal that's going to go sour. That's not going to happen quickly. People have had decades to learn. No, 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 you don't want to admit closed loss. No, 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 one more golf game, you'll be good. And so you have to create an understanding that the definition of doing the right thing has now changed. We used to collect data for good reasons. We had very dense data where every field in the database had, had something in it. Now we've got these very sparse fields. Uh, Amazon's recommendation engine. I'm sorry, even in my case, the number of things I've bought from Amazon is an infinitesimal fraction of a fraction of the things that they could sell me. And so that matrix is mostly zeros. Traditional software doesn't deal well with that kind of data. Um, Apple's watch will forecast AFib. Used to be we only put a recorder on you if you showed symptoms. And now most of the people wearing that thing have never had a bad heart incident in their lives. What is the result? The result is that 55% uh, of the um, cases are, are going to be false positives. And people are going to be calling their doctor at 1 a.m. saying, my watch says I'm going to die. No, it really doesn't. And so we have to acquaint ourselves with a new mathematics of the kind of data that we will be collecting. And we will have to become much more aggressive about evaluating data and say, I don't believe you. Because this nutritional study irre irrevocably implies that at least one child ate 60 carrots at one sitting. So I'm sorry, I simply don't believe you. Your data doesn't make sense. And we need to be aggressive about that. We need to have analytic tools that will allow us to do that well. Exponential growth means that we're on the second half of the chessboard. You've heard the legend of the inventor of chess being rewarded by the emperor with a grain of rice on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and so on. First half of the chessboard is just the equivalent of one large field of rice. Second half of the chessboard is more rice than has been produced in the history of the human race. Second half of the chessboard wallops you upside the head with the reality of exponential behavior. Again, and again, and again. But it takes conviction to place bets on exponential. It takes, it takes guts and data and analytic tools to say, we have to build the systems now that can deal with the capacity we will see in a year. Fortunately, the mathematics and the economics of cloud make that much more feasible than it used to be. 
because exponential reality, the world in which we live, demands that we understand. We don't start developing our talent pool in the junior year of college. We start developing our talent pool in sixth grade or earlier. We have to understand why does equal pay matter so much? Because 56% of the children who live in poverty in the United States live in a female-headed household. And the circumstances of their childhood are going to have a lifetime impact on their educational and economic uh, contributions. And that's why this is not something you do because it feels good. This is something you do because failure to do it is going to bite you, and the math proves it. And the same is true for all of the other things that are up here, things like you know, sustainability and so on. Stein's law, if it can't go on forever, at some point it must stop. And so many things that we're doing today simply can't go on forever, and we need to ask that question. What is your plan? What is your strategy for acknowledging the finitude of certain capacities and resources and then turning that into an opportunity to deliver a superior experience? instead of a doomsaying prediction that everything's going to be terrible. It's not going to be terrible. It's going to be wonderful if we do it right. And I hope that today has been about learning how to do it right, because John Maynard Keynes may never have actually said, when the facts change, I change my mind. He probably didn't also say the sentence that comes after, what do you do? And at the end of today, I hope everyone goes home thinking about something you're going to talk to the person in the mirror in the morning about, about the conversation you're going to have, the relationship you're going to build, the data source you're going to go out and explore, even though it always seemed too difficult to get at it before, the technology that if you can't build it yourself, you're going to find someone who can partner with, it, partner with you to do it. I want you tomorrow to make a promise to yourself that you will do something you wouldn't have done if you hadn't had the kinds of experiences and conversations and insights that have been the product of today. Thank you.